Hello, we have a very special event today presented by the University of Kentucky debate team. The first ever, at least to my knowledge, virtual public debate. My name is Casey Harrigan. I'm the Associate Director of Debate at UK. The topic for today's debate is Resolved, the United States federal government should substantially increase its deployment of space weapons. This topic is similar to the 2019-2020 NDT CETA resolution, which our squad just finished debating, and I will place a full copy of the resolution in the notes to this video below. The format for the debate is similar to a traditional policy <coughs> debate with some modifications. There will be three constructive speeches, each followed by one minute of cross-examination and two final rebuttals. The affirmative will speak first and last, which will be balanced by the negative speaking for slightly longer time in the middle. Introducing our debaters, we have four soon to be graduating seniors. On the affirmative side, Anthony Trufinoff and Genevieve Hackman, and on the negative side, Maria Sanchez and Dan Manster. And I will now turn it over to Anthony for the first affirmative constructive. In March, 2018, President Trump announced the creation of a sixth branch of the armed forces, the United States Space Force. He said, when it comes to defending America, it is not enough to merely have an American presence in space. We must have American dominance in space. The strategic concept underlying this announcement is sound. The space environment of the 21st century is primed to be a central and vital battleground, and the United States has no choice but to accept the necessity of defending it vigorously. Thus, we stand resolved that the United States federal government should substantially increase its deployment of space weapons. The stakes are enormous. Space is not simply a place for scientific exploration and idle curiosity, but is inextricable from all areas of modern life. One sphere where this is true is economic. Satellites that orbit the Earth in space are fundamental to the health of the United States and global economy. As Garrett Graff of Politico writes, satellites have become linchpins of the global economy, and GPS, has become perhaps the most indispensable global system ever designed by humans, the infrastructure upon which the rest of the world's infrastructure is based. And yet, he continues, due to lack of appropriate defense, many remain, quote, unarmored, billion dollar sitting ducks. Space also has strategic importance. The United States military is modern, digital, and depends upon the instant communication and information that space assets provide. Our adversaries, though they lag in many areas of hard power, are aware of this so-called asymmetric dependence and are purposefully targeting our space systems in order to degrade U.S. warfighting. In response, we cannot be complacent. The U.S. must take active steps to respond to changing space conditions that threaten fundamental national interests. We don't back militarization lightly. Rather, we support it because we recognize the simple truth. Space will be weaponized whether we want it to be or not. Our obligation is to maintain an appropriate advantage to keep the peace that has underpinned prosperity on Earth for decades. As Robert Zubrin writes, to deter aggression, it won't be by matching potential adversaries tank for tank, division for division. <coughs> Rather, the United States must seek to totally outgun them by obtaining a radical technological advantage. This can be done by achieving space supremacy. Our belief is that these weapons will never have to be used. The deterrent effect alone will be overwhelming. But if not, having such capabilities will be essential to winning a future war in space. Should adversaries choose to target U.S. assets regardless of U.S. dominance, having a robust suite of potential options to respond and defeat such actions will be essential. In conclusion, as Peter Kamasai, MPA in space policy from George Washington University, wrote, a space arms race is impending. Nations have already started deploying space weapons. Being a leader in space now will require fewer resources than trying to surpass other nations later. Therefore, the U.S. will have to pay the cost of catching up if it does not lead the charge in space weaponization. Therefore, the wisest choice of action is to deploy space weapons now when it is our choice rather than later when it is not. Thank you. And I'm open for cross-examination. Okay, so you've mentioned that Russia, China, and others are building space weapons but it seems that their technology is significantly behind ours. What specifically are they building that could threaten our space assets? So they've both, uh, both Russia and China have demonstrated dramatic space capabilities. In 2007, China conducted a highly damaging test in which they destroyed a satellite in low Earth orbit. And remember, China and Russia only have to outpace U.S. defenses. So even if U.S. offense has the potential to be much stronger, they still have an asymmetric capability like we talked about. Okay, um, but if it's true that 
a space war would significantly damage the global economy, why would China or Russia engage in such actions when they have such a huge stake in the global economy? So like we said, our argument is about the pursuit of relative power. So sure, everybody would be damaged by a confrontation in space, but Russia and China expect that because of their asymmetric capability, they could make a relative gain compared to the United States position in the world by launching a preemptive war in space. Thank you. Okay. In our role as a negative team, we disagree with the affirmative premise that the United States should deploy space weapons and thus negate today's resolution. We believe that such a course of action is unnecessary, dangerous, and ultimately counterproductive for the purposes of protecting critical space assets. While we agree that space is a critical terrain for both economic and strategic reasons, we believe weaponization is not the best path for future space security. First, the affirmative has overstated the imminent threat to U.S. space assets by adversaries. Advanced space powers like China and Russia have immature systems incapable of threatening our key systems. Their anti-satellite capabilities can only reach targets in low Earth orbit with a maximum vertical target height of around 10,000 kilometers. Even ICBMs would only reach a distance of around 15,000 kilometers. Both are far short of geostationary orbit, around 20,000 kilometers, where the United States' most important early warning communications and signals intelligence satellites orbit. Second, because of the interconnectedness of the modern economy, destroying satellites is not likely to be adversary's preferred strategy, even if it were to be possible. Were China to destroy key satellites, they would threaten their own economy, upon which the Chinese Communist Party depends for legitimacy and continued survival. Additionally, the military benefits of a space Pearl Harbor are also suspect. According to Dr. Jagannath Sankaran of the University of Texas, the GPS constellation consists of 30 satellites and six orbital planes. Even if six satellites were to be destroyed simultaneously, he concludes that degradation in navigation signals would last for only 95 minutes. Such a small window would be tactically useless and beyond the present capabilities of most states. Furthermore, U.S. weapons deployment would only increase threats we face in outer space. Other countries would rightfully fear for their own security if the United States embarked upon large-scale space weaponization. As a final frontier governed by the Outer Space Treaty, space has been consistently held as a shared commons and not a plane of conflict. Were the United States to breach this long-standing international norm, it would risk a global arms race as other countries would not accept being left behind. Additionally, development of space weapons would at best present a pyrrhic victory. With thousands of indigi individual satellites spread out over huge distances and the rapid speed of all objects, including ASAT weaponry, it would be impossible for the United States to simply shoot down incoming threats. Decades of repeated attempts and failures while developing terrestrial ballistic missile defense would be child's play compared to the immense difficulty <coughs> with doing so in space. Finally, instead of pursuing safety through arms buildup, the United States would be better served by moving in the opposite direction, towards arms control. Russia, China, and Europe have all indicated willingness to negotiate formal limits on weapon deployment in space. While there remain differences in approach, the U.S. could compromise or suggest its own preferred course of action. This would limit threats in space and build upon the long tradition of arms control in improving trust, confidence, and relations between great powers on Earth. Thank you, and I'm open for cross-examination. So you described some limitations to Russian and Chinese direct ascent ASATs, but there are also other kinds of threats. For example, there are co-orbital ASATs, which involve sending a spacecraft that pretends to be a repair satellite, but it could close in on critical satellites and physically disable them. Do you believe this is a significant threat? Uh, we don't think that it is a significant threat now, especially because those types of capabilities would require large-scale deployments that would just be technically impossible. So for example, Russia and China could theoretically disable an individual satellite, but that would not amount to a first strike that can take out a large portion of our key capabilities. You mentioned several arms control proposals, but the history of arms control with Russia and China is checkered with accusations of non-compliance and cheating. How do we know that such an agreement would be verifiable, especially considering even the meaning of a space weapon is under contention? That there's certainly some disagreement on what constitutes a space weapon, but that 
we think that that is only a reason why we should continue to have more sustained dialogue and cooperation with China and Russia so that we can iron out those details and also work out systems of uh, compliance and um, verifiability of whatever arms control agreement we decide to adopt. Thank you. The threat to the United States in space is imminent and real. Our opponents are far too sanguine about its prospects, understate adversaries' capabilities, and narrowly focus on only certain ASOCs to the neglect of others. The risk of attacks is high. Adversaries are willing to sacrifice short-term economic damage for long-term strategic gains and know that the U.S. depends on space far more than they do. This asymmetric necessity creates a strategic vulnerability that others are willing to exploit. In 2007, China tested an ASAT weapon, which other states have done, but chose to target a satellite at 750 kilometers, a level significantly higher than any previous test. This created a debris field that some believe will last for centuries. This will surely damage their own space interests, but they did so anyways because they knew it would likely be more consequential for the United States. Beyond this, there are many forms of weapons that are being developed now and make attacks feasible without widespread economic damage. Both Russia and China are investing in co-orbital ASATs, essentially dedicated spacecraft that will perform rendezvous and proximity operations, coming near satellites under seemingly peaceful pretenses of servicing only to reveal their hostile intent and physically disable key assets. This will allow target attacks that produce minimal debris and can degrade military capabilities without affecting commercial satellites. This, in addition to the range of weaponry that is already available, uh, including jammers, radio frequency interference, and ground-based lasers. Focusing solely on direct ascent, uh, ascent missiles, as the negative has done, misses the larger evolving picture. Further, fears of an arms race spurred by U.S. actions are overstated. As we said in the first affirmative speech, we do not advocate weapons deployment as a choice, but as a necessity. The arms race in space is happening now. The U.S. can either develop along with it and stay ahead of the game, or in reaction once we're already behind. Either way, we'll eventually be forced into such a position, but want, waiting makes the costs much greater. Our opponents overstate the effect of U.S. policies on others. The premise underlying their argument is that U.S. norms shape the weapons policies of other states. That's hardly true. Russia and China are realist, power-maximizing adversaries. They will follow whatever course best suits their interests, regardless of what the United States do uh, does. Whether they may put out a front that criticizes U.S. policies that they dislike, that is near window dressing for the hard reality that they will seek and pursue any strategy that provides them with a relative advantage. This has been proven throughout history. For example, according to Trevor Brown of Nyang Technological University, after the Clinton administration scrapped the Strategic Defense Initiative in 1993, China redoubled its efforts in military space. Last, our opponents suggest that arms control would be more effective than militarization. As Trevor Brown again writes, the hard truth is that as long as U.S. economic and military power depends on space assets, the incentive for potential foe to attack then remains too great to be overcome by any international agreement. And as Christopher Stone from the Space Review, by reading decades of Russian and Chinese open source planning and doctrine papers, it appears the Russian and Chinese are moving towards weaponizing space, but they are blaming the U.S. falsely for doing it first as their excuse. They are luring the arms control community into blaming the victim. The best policy and the only one effective against determined adversaries is one that assures U.S. space security through developing and deploying these weapons will produce peace through strength, altering adversaries' willingness to attack by raising the cost of doing so, and ensuring our satellites remain protected should any nation choose otherwise. Thank you. I am now open for cross-examination. So if an adversary were to target the United States with jammers, how would advanced space weapons deter that? And would you recommend that the United States use space lasers in response? Ambiguity in U.S. response postures would be sufficient to deter that action by another country. Right now, the cost seen by any other country to attacking U.S. satellite is low because they know the U.S. doesn't necessarily have the capability to attack them in response. But if they were to develop better technological capabilities in space, that would allow us to convince the opponent that the costs are too high to risk it. So lasers could be one option that would be on the table for the U.S. to use. And so even if adversaries may not fully restrain themselves if the U.S. forgoes weapons development, is it not also the case that the U.S. that U.S. deployments would encourage them to accelerate and develop certain types of weapons that they would not otherwise? Accelerating weapons development is happening now. Like we've stated in our speeches, Russia and China are developing new weapons like 
co-orbital ASATs that would be able to attack the United States. The only question is whether or not the United States can develop a sufficient capability to show Russia and China that the costs of using those would be worse uh, than the current status quo. U.S. space weapons development would be dangerous and ineffective and foregoes alternatives like arms control that would better address the harm. In order to justify such a huge departure from the status quo, it is the affirmative's burden to present an overwhelming case for the necessity of such a course, and they have not done so. First, the risks posed to the United States are low. Most other countries have modest counter space programs. Russia and Chinese ASATs cannot hit key U.S. military satellites in geostationary orbit of 20,000 kilometers or higher, which makes GPS, communications, and SIGINT operations absolutely secure. Other threats they have identified are years or decades down the road, and even then the risk is hardly severe. Further, even if the capability for such an action existed, the affirmative has not at all demonstrated its propensity. It is fundamentally inaccurate to say that any country, any other country has indicated clear intent to start a space war. On the contrary, over the past 50 years, the norms established by the Outer Space Treaty have remained relatively robust. No nation has deployed weapons of mass destruction in space. There have been no serious claims to territory, and space itself has remained a global commons. The reason for this is not only that all states recognize the futility of an unwinnable conflict in the skies, it is economic. States are self-deterred because they realize that war would be a losing proposition for an ever-growing part of the global economy. The CCP understands that their legitimacy depends on continued economic growth and wouldn't be willing to risk it. Second, provocative moves such as deploying space lasers would only worsen security by encouraging arms buildups and countermeasures by other countries. Russia and China would obviously not take U.S. development sitting down. Before our first system was deployed, they would not only be well on their way to fielding systems to bypass it, but would also create dangerous weapons of their own. Third, if our goal is to maximize space security, arms control is a more fruitful path. Numerous scholars have identified methods of introducing verifiable arms control of ASATs, lasers, co-orbitals, and more. And the efficacy of this has been proven by post-Cold War nuclear reductions. If such a model were deemed inadequate, there's also the potential for constraints on behavior instead of constraints on capabilities, which is shown by the EU proposed code of conduct, which could set standards for close approach, reduce interference, and create mechanisms for communication like hotlines or regular forums that avert misperception or miscalculation in the event of an incident in space. While there are some historical examples of non-compliance and arms control, the preponderance, the preponderance of history suggests that this approach is vastly superior to arms racing. There have been critical treaties such as the NPT, the Limited Test Ban Treaty, the Chemical Weapons Convention, and the Biological Weapons Convention, which have all succeeded at least incrementally in moving the world towards restraint. The same is possible in the area of space weapons. With continued determination, the needle can be pushed towards a safer world. Thank you. With the final speech in today's debate, we conclude with a reiteration of our opening premise. With the space environment transforming, it is incumbent upon the United States to maintain global security through a robust deterrent. This requires an immediate effort to deploy resources required to keep critical assets safe. Our opponents have agreed with the fundamental economic and strategic necessity of protecting satellites. Underpinning trillions of dollars in wealth and underwriting global security, space is paramount. The question is which strategy is most effective for producing safety, weaponization or arms control? Our contention is that weaponization is the only effective and verifiable means to prevent conflict and that no alternative is sufficient. Our opponent's concern about a global arms race is non-unique. The arms race is happening now. We are already witnessing a rapid proliferation of all facets of space weaponry, from direct descent weapons, such as those developed by China and India, to lasers and jammers developed by Russia, and surely more we can't even imagine in the near future. The United States is not at fault. This is driven by many realist countries seeking rationally to maximize their power in space and being driven to asymmetrically counter overwhelming U.S. military power in other areas. Restraint is not an option. The U.S. only has a choice between acting now, establishing leadership and deterring attacks before they can occur, or waiting until after others proliferate and then being forced to catch up from behind. Either way, weapons deployments are inevitable, but the cost in blood and treasure will be much greater if the U.S. is slow on the uptake. Alternative options like arms control are ineffective and unrealistic. As the experts we have previously quoted have said, 
the incentive to attack remains too great to be overcome by any international agreement. When it comes to our country's future, we cannot rely on mere words on a piece of paper. History teaches that nations only speak the language of power. If the United States wants to shape the behavior of others, it must do so from a position of strength, not weakness. This requires fielding the assets required to deter and defeat attacks on US satellites. Thank you.